I was digging in the refrigerator this morning and there's some oat milk uh, in the refrigerator. And uh, on the side, there was this picture of the CEO of this oat milk uh, manufacturer. And usually you don't see the CEO of the, you know, the oat milk manufacturer, right? And the guy had a quote on the side that says, I love my products. And I thought that was an interesting quote on the side of oat milk. Uh, and then I thought about it, you know, would I be willing to uh, say that about what I do? It's just sort of an interesting thought. I love my products. And I, you know, I, I sort of do. I love what I do and I love what we produce here. And then I was thinking about this particular message and I was like, well, I sort of like this message, right? I even like how it's put together. It's not the most attractive because I'm gonna use color in this message that is not even my favorite color. That'll make sense as we go. But I love this message or I love this product. I'm not exactly sure if you will. <laughs> that's, that's still to uh, be discovered as we move forward. Uh, Yoked Together is the title, and uh, the picture is not misleading, it's just it could be misleading. It, you can tell that there's some kind of love uh, thing going on here. You have, uh, it looks like a man's hand holding on to a delicate, you know, feminine hand, and there's an embrace, and then you see the word yoked together, you're thinking marriage. And there's nothing wrong with that, because that is one of the enunciations of being yoked together. What I would like to explore is the idea of what it means to be yoked, and then as a result, spread that idea into some other territories. And uh, it, marriage is important in that. And so I, I definitely need grace for what we're about to go into. Uh, so what I have is, I'm gonna say raw materials for our message. So I have uh, eight different raw materials. You're going to notice in front of each one of those is a color. And so we're going to go to the next slide and uh, you're going to notice that mm, I just created a rainbow on our screen. Those eight are going to be linked with a color. Now I'm doing this. This is, this is a challenge, okay? What, what Eric has done for this is I'm trying to take eight different truths and weave them together. And there are very few things that could easily enunciate that, but a rainbow, ironically, is one of them. And most of you know that a rainbow has been taken hostage in our generation, and a rainbow is God's insignia. It's his statement. It's his, uh, like Zorro has the Z that he leaves after he has done his work. Well, God leaves a rainbow when he has done his work. And so as a result, in a strange way, this is sort of a pushback in declaring the rainbow to be God's, but also to show how these colors work together to say something. And so we'll, we'll sort of work through this together, but you'll notice that in the top I have the concept of a word, and then fact, faith, and experience is the second one. The third one, which is yellow, the brilliance of yoking oxen. None of these are going to sound like they at all go together, right? Uh, number four, the origin of gender. Boy, this is odd. This message just got weird right there. Uh, number five, the principle of exception. Number six, God hates divorce. And seven, God's ways are perfect. Now, how in the world, if you just threw those pieces out on the, the table and said, Eric, put a message together, I would really struggle. And that's, it's nice that I didn't have to go through it that way. Uh, in other words, something was already in my heart burdening me, and then it was like, okay, how do I express this? And this is the odd way that Eric is doing it. Now, if you're getting this via podcast, you don't get all my cool color. And I feel bad for people that are getting this via podcast. So with each one, I'm going to keep a color constant. And so as we begin to weave these truths together into a rainbow, uh, you're going to see these, these different colors are symbolic of things. So the concept of a word it's the carrying device of the invisible, revealing something that otherwise would be impossible to see. Now, I have used this illustration for many years in our training, but uh, there's Brent Cooper over there, and if I wanted to uh, have Brent Cooper read my mind, imagine that I had a thought in my mind, and I was like, Brent, uh, tell me what my thought is. It'd be really hard for Brent to pull that off. Why? Because you can't see a thought. It is invisible. But I really want him to know my thought. So what I do is I take my thought and I clothe it in a word and I shoot it out of my mouth and it flies through the air and goes into his ear canal, into his brain, 
And because he recognizes that word, he is able to unpack my thought and understand it even though my thought was invisible. A word is able to carry the invisible from my mind, my heart, into Brent's. That is an extraordinary reality. And of course, the whole point of that is to recognize that there is a word, capital W, known as Jesus Christ. You see, there is an invisible attributes of God. There is an invisible nature of God. There is an invisible truth. You can't see it. You can't discern God on your own. And yet God has revealed himself. How could you understand and fathom the God who created the heavens and the earth? I, you know, if, if you were to you know, say it's correct, the scientists are correct, that it would take over a million years moving at light speed to get to the nearest major galaxy. So imagine that that's true. That is a long time. A million years is a long time to start with, okay? The earth since Adam has been around just under 6,000 years. And so a million years, moving at light speed, which, you know, I don't, what was it, like seven, eight times around the earth in one second is how fast light works. Moving at that speed, a million years just to get to the next major galaxy, and there's estimated to be over 200 billion galaxies. And our God is over all of that. How in our limited pea brain uh, construction could we possibly fathom this God, and yet this God has made himself known? How can we know him? Via his word. And so a word is a carrying device to reveal the invisible. That's just my first building block. And this is actually an orange color. The first one was red. The second one is orange. And I don't know if you guys know your Roy G. Biv, you know, for uh, colors of the rainbow, but we are making our way through Roy right now. Isn't that fun? And fact, faith, and experience. And I'm calling it the key to the impossible life. So in, a, in an Ellerslie semester, I go through this truth, oh, I think the average is around 23 times in a semester. And there's a reason for that because there's very few things that can enunciate this concept as well as this one illustration. And that is that there are three characters that are walking the ridgepole of a barn. Now, that doesn't sound very difficult, but I'm going to tell you it's impossible to do. It's like a razor's edge. And the first character's name is fact, the second one is faith, and the third one is experience. Now, fact gets up there to walk the ridgepole and he begins to walk it. Now, I just told you it was impossible, but fact goes out there and just starts doing it. And you're thinking, Eric, I think you need to redefine impossible because your first character is carrying it out. And yet this first character is something special. You see, in Christianity, we don't use the word fact. That isn't even a normal word for us to use. We use the word truth because it's a person. And that person is actually Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has come to this earth and embodied truth and then lived it in front of us, which is impossible. And any of us try and get up and live out that truth, to live out the way that God has designed us to live, we can't do it. It is impossible by definition, but there is a character in our story named Fact that is going to get up there on that ridgepole and begin to walk it. Now, faith is where we come in. This is where we have to make a decision. And, you, and when faith fixes its gaze on the fact, Faith actually gains something, gains balance, supernatural balance, to be able to follow and to be able to pull off the impossible. And life would be all good and beautiful and we'd be pulling off the impossible if there wasn't a third character. Now we're calling this character experience, but this character, like fact, could have various names. And one of the other names is feelings. And many of us feel our way to our conclusions. However, Christianity, the secret of it is to believe the word. And when we believe the facts, when we believe the truth, we gain balance and are able to pull off an impossible life. But when we heed our experience, when we heed our emotion, we lose balance. Emotion or feeling and experience are always reaching out and clawing at our shirt sleeve, begging us to consult them before we actually believe this, before we actually follow this. And when we do that, we end up losing our balance and falling off the ridge pole, and there's that nice, juicy uh, manure pile down there at the bottom of the barn that many of us have spent a good deal of our life in that, yes, once again, we revisit. And so if you were to ask me, does God care about our feelings? Does God care about our emotions? Does God care about our experience? Of course he does. 
However, the way to get your experience, your feelings, your emotions to gain balance and pull off the impossible is you have to ignore them. You cannot allow them to be a lead defining instrument in your life. You must turn your back on them and say, no, you will not define my course. My course is defined by what God has revealed to me. And so when you follow the facts, when faith follows fact and does not heed experience, emotion, and all that noise behind, it gains balance and is able to pull off the impossible. So the secret for feelings to actually gain balance, the secret for experience to gain balance and pull off the impossible is that faith must ignore them. And when it does, then they gain balance and truly the remarkable supernatural life occurs on this earth. All right, guys, you ready for another color? It's it's so funny because it feels like, what does that have to do with anything? But all of these sound so random. Uh, And this is a yellow color and this is called the brilliance of yoking oxen. (laughs) And I I have to be right there with you. This sounds very uh, out of uh, the blue. And so when you think of yoking, if I were to stick a yoke on you, would you consider that a positive or a negative? I'd say for most of us, we would probably go with the negative, okay? It doesn't sound like a very positive thing. And I think with enslavement, since we have sort of been these, in the past few generations, we've been emerging out of uh, slavery mindsets. And it's just like, yeah, a yoke around the neck, not a good thing. And so as a result, we usually have a very negative conception of it. What's interesting is in the Bible, it portrays it both ways. There is a very negative uh, version of a yoke, and there's also a very positive version of a yoke. And so first off, I'd sort of like to introduce you to the positive, because without the positive, you don't understand a lot of what Scripture is saying. So, hmm, are you sure a yoke is a good thing? It's interesting, because now here's, here's how I'm gonna do this. Whenever I have a sub point in that color, I'm going to, like this one says 3A, right? See, but it's a yellow color. And I, I don't know if you guys notice yolk, and that looks like an egg yolk. I, I don't know if you guys noticed that, but I, I sort of appreciated that, you know? So you can help me with your memory on that one. But 3A, the blessed, beautiful yolk. It's a gift when it is God's yolk. When it is a God-given yolk, it's actually a gift to us. There are other ways to get a yoke, and those are not positive experiences. That isn't what God designed us for, but God did design us to actually carry a yoke. But a yoke is a blessed, beautiful thing. And it's actually a gift, and a lot of times if you've heard of yoking oxen, one oxen with a plow behind him and a big field in front of him that's a, that's a really heavy weight for one oxen. But when you have another oxen that pulls up that is just perfectly suited to that oxen and then you provide a yoke, that oxen is very happy to have that yoke because that means he can get the job done. That means that which was going to be heavy is lightened. It's actually a gift. However, most of us don't always translate it that way. So Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 29, this is Jesus speaking, come to me, all you, who are lab- all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So obviously we have a premise point here that Jesus is offering us a yoke, and then he describes this yoke. And it's in order to get this job done, you need to actually take on this yoke. You need to be knit together with someone known as Jesus Christ. And if you are, you can carry out what otherwise would be an impossible task. You can make it happen in your life. Philippians 4, 3, this is Paul speaking, and he's going to say, and I urge you also, true companion, but that word for true companion is actually a yoke fellow. So the same word for what a yoke is in the Koine Greek is going to be used there that instead of it just being a true companion, you're my yoke fellow. Isn't that a weird, I mean, that isn't a term we would use. I don't know how many of you have ever come up to someone, punched them in the arm and say, hey, just want you to know I love you, yoke fellow. (laughs) I mean, now that you've heard me say it, I can see you all starting to do it. Uh, (laughs) However, yoke fellow isn't a normal phrase that we have, and yet it means something, and it's actually an endearing, affectionate phrase, Uh, like dear friend, because it's someone who has carried weights with you and enabled you to get through difficult times because they carried weights with you. 
That's a yoke fellow. Not a, again, not a term we have used commonly in our English jargon, but one that might be an interesting one to uh, begin to throw in. So I need to read the whole thing because I only read the beginning. And I urge you also, true companion or true yoke fellow, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. That's Philippians 4.3. So a yoke is, if you were to, st- I, I spent some time studying yokes, which is sort of a, a funny thing, uh, you know, Eric studying yokes, because it's not like I live in an agrarian culture, I haven't been around it very much, and, and yet it's very interesting uh, because it's an enabler. It's sort of the way we would say in Scripture, you know, in the New Covenant understanding, it's the Holy Spirit or grace. It has that type of function to it. So it's an enabler helping the oxen lighten their task and actually get the otherwise impossible job done. We have an impossible task, and we can't pull it off in and of ourselves, but if we take on the yoke that he has supplied to us, which sounds funny because it sounds like a burden when I say it, right? But if we take on and accept that help, we are enabled to carry this out. Why? Because we are now being yoked with the one who can carry it out. We are being yoked with God to be able to accomplish a task that otherwise we couldn't do. A yoke is a symbol of intimate sharing. So when you are yoked with someone else, it's actually a statement that you are sharing life with them. It is an intimate connectivity. And so we have this in our relationship with Jesus Christ. This is his harvest field. And yet we are sharing in that same yoke, that same, you could call it burden, but in the most positive sense, that same task is now being shared with God and man, man with God. And we're doing this together. And as a result, it's a symbol of intimacy. I don't know how many of you have ever thought of a yoke being intimacy. And yet, of course, when you think of that equally yoked statement that gets associated with marriage a lot, Well, that's what it is. You want to be yoked because you're going to be sharing a task together. And it's intimacy. So Jesus offers it as a gift to his dearest friends. And Paul affectionately refers to the body of Christ as his yoke fellow. A yoke is, I know this might be hard to believe at first, but a beautiful thing. Now, if you just saw the piece of wood carved, I don't know that you'd say, that is the most attractive piece of wood I've ever seen. However, If you talk to a farmer that works with oxen, when they see oxen working together and they see that yoke binding them, it is like awe-inspiring to them. Heard multiple quotes this last week on that. It's like, it's one of the most beautiful things. When you see these creatures that are carrying out a task, but they can carry it out so easily when they have the strength of each other. And neither one of them is overburdened for the task, and they're able to accomplish something that one of them couldn't accomplish on their own, or it would be extremely taxing to them to accomplish it. And so it's like, it's a beautiful thing. What an interesting quote. It's a beautiful thing. When a yoke is put upon the shoulders of the oxen correctly, balanced and with the wisdom of selectivity, i.e. same height, pull, strength, and readiness for the work, it is, ama- it is an amazing thing to behold how easy the work can get done. So to equally yoke oxen is actually part of the art form. In other words, height is important because that yoke uh, needs to be balanced and having it be level, of course, is, is important. But then, you know, I, I talked about pull strength. In other words, if one pulls harder than the other, that could create an unequal yoke, which then can cause the burden to swing towards one and not towards the other. And then you also have the readiness for work. You could have them both be able to pull, but could you imagine one doesn't want to? Well, you sort of need the, the, the equal readiness. And so when you can combine those factors, it is an amazing thing to behold how easy the work can get done. Number three, and now you see a B on there, still my yellow color, the cursed miserable yoke. So if you study scripture, if you just type in yoke uh, into your search, you're going to find that there's a lot of negative yoke, uh, that, yoking that is going on. And I'm going to say it's a terror when it is the yoke that comes with disobedience. So there seems to be a yoke that God has defined for us, that he actually desires to enable us to carry work. And he wants us to be yoked the way he designed us to be yoked. But it is possible to be yoked to things that you were never intended to be yoked to. 
that that isn't God's plan for you to be yoked in that situation. And when you yoke yourself to things that you're not supposed to, it is a burden upon your life and it is a form of enslavement. It is a form of trauma to your soul. And yet many of us have been bound to things, you could call it a stronghold of sin, for instance, where you have given way to something and you have allowed the enemy to stick a yoke around you and connect you with something else. Yeah, I don't like this character, you know, fear. I don't want to be walking with fear. Well, I don't want to be walking with lust. And yet you find yourself bound to it. And it's a yoke that comes through disobedience. And so praise God that he's very good at breaking yokes off. And yet, if you've ever tried to carry out a task when you're yoked to things that hold you back and hinder you, I wouldn't blame you for uh, giving way to a little grumbling in that. This isn't the way you were designed. You see, a yoke is meant to be a blessing and an encouragement to you, but the enemy loves to subvert its use and to cause you to be yoked to things that would actually hinder you or impair you from forward movement. Stand fast, therefore, this is Paul in Galatians 5.1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Jesus Christ, in and through his shed blood, is breaking yokes. Those connections that we have had with our old man and sin in the flesh, there is a breaking there is a cutting off of that relationship, and that's part of what we discover in coming to Jesus. So if we have been set free, let's not go back and take on that yoke again. Of course, that's what Paul is saying, and yet many in the church today have justified going back to a yoke of sin because God is forgiving, oh, and he, he understands, and that's the exact opposite direction that God is wooing our soul. He's saying, I've set you free from that terrible, horrible yoke so that you could be yoked to me and so that your life could carry out its purpose and fulfill its task. Number three, C. You guys see the yellow color still up there? You guys enjoying my color scheme here? I don't know. Some of you are still sort of silent on the issue. You haven't been like going, I love it. Love that rainbow color, Eric. <laughs> haven't heard that yet. Uh, it's three C, the concept of yoking in scripture. So what does God say in Scripture? He has four different terms that he is going to use, and I'm not very uh, good with pronouncing that top one with that D sound on the front. You know, how, how that helps me with a pronunciation guide to stick a D in front of a Z. Uh, it's a zugos, right? And then you, the next one is zugos. I can do that one. Okay, that, that's, it's actually zugos, technically. So zugos and then zugos. They sound exactly the same to me. But a yoke is going to be that which is that carved piece of wood, okay? That's what a zugos is. That has that D sound on the front of the zugos, okay? I don't know how to add that in very well. Even when I listened to it, it sounded exactly like it didn't have a D there. So it's like, this doesn't help me. Why is the D there in the pronunciation guide? And then a yoke pair is going to be the two that are being linked together, okay? And then the joint, to join or yoke together, which is suzugnomi, means that's what God is doing when he's yoking. He's sticking it on the two, on the pair, and he's connecting them for the job. And then we have a yoke fellow. This is one that has shared a task. Like the field is done, that's my yoke fellow. So that is the sudzugas. And that's your yoke fellow. That's the one that you shared the task with, okay? So that's how scripture is actually going to enunciate it. Very interesting because for most of us, yoking doesn't mean a lot, just to be honest. It, we're multiple steps away from it. So let's go through uh, these, and I'm going to look at it in a spiritual light. So this is the same yellow color of yoking, right? And we're going to look at that first word, and this is that piece of wood that is crafted, it's balanced, and it's meant to hold these two together. There's two that are meant to be together, and this is them being brought together. This is what helps them share that weight. So I'm gonna call this the God solution for the human life. That which unites, brings together, enables, and lightens the load. There, is, there are things that God has united you with. Okay, now most of us are thinking marriage when we think of yoke, right? And that's not bad. And that's, of course, my, the graphic in the very beginning is going to give that leaning. But there are a lot of things that you have been yoked to that you might not even realize that God has put a yoke on so that your life could succeed. And when we as humans throw off those yokes 
and we say, I don't want that, it actually has a, a, a tremendous power to destroy our life when we forsake what God has given us to actually help us. So the next one is that yoke pair, zugos, two that were matched together by God for the purpose of getting a job done. Now, I am going to give a hint of where I'm going with this message by saying, when you see that it says two that were matched, you think people, and I'm going to say it might not be people, it might be two things. It might be you with something uh, that was matched. Okay, no, I, I'm just saying, okay, I'm giving a hint there of where I'm going with this, but don't read too far into it. Just stay with me in the moment, okay? And then to join or yoke together, this is that suguzo no me. To the joining together by God when he attaches the yoke to the yoke pair. This is a God task. Only God could do that in this situation. Now, there's things that we can do. We can yoke ourselves to things. We can. However, there's also a God version of yoking, and that's, of course, what I'm interested in today. And then a yoke fellow. Remember the one that shares the task with you? Two that have labored together as a yoke pair with the help of God's yoke and have shared in the beauties and affections of the bonding experience. Number four, the origin of gender. What does this have to do with anything? Eric, do you even know what you're talking about today? You're all over the map. And so this is my green color. Remember, we're at Roy, we finished Roy out of Roy G. Biv, out of the colors of the rainbow, and now we're at G. A G gets to sort of stand alone in the middle, so we definitely have a little extra attention on this one today. The origin of gender. It is something that has always been fact. Feeling has never had anything to do with it. And you could say, Eric, do you know where you're going right now? Are you safe? Are you, have you thought this through? I have. Gender has never been an issue of what you feel. It has always been an issue of a fact. And when you try and move it into the territory of feeling, something is off. And yet, in our culture, gender has, for some reason, been shoved to this other side of feeling and as a result, we have a lot of falling off of ridge poles into <coughs> cow patties waiting below. Life cannot work when we distance ourselves from the fact and allow our feelings to control us. The origin of gender, I'm going to call this the divine root system of gender. Where does gender come from? What is its source? So I'm going to start with the fact that God is. So God is, which means he was, he is, and he always will be the same. And he has always been the same, which means who he is has never altered. If he was love way back 2,000 years ago, he still is love today. And if he's love today, he's still going to be love forever and always. God never alters. So if he's holy way back 2,000 years ago, well, then he's holy today, and he's holy forever and always. So God is and it means he's unalterable. He, he will never change. And yet, one of the things that he has revealed his isness through, if you could say it that way, is he has made man in his holy image the way he is. So God is, and there's a certain image that he bears. And God has created man in an image of who he is. And so that image doesn't alter or change either. And so the image that he's created us in is sort of like the glove that overlays the invisible hand. That glove is not the hand, but it's made in the image of the hand. And when that glove submits to that image that it was created in, it functions as it ought to function. If it rejects its original design and tries to function over here and flop around, it cannot produce the impact in the world that it was designed to, to, to have by simply submitting to its original design. And so God is, and he's also created us in an image of who he is. And he has declared that his creation of man is and was very good. In other words, he wasn't complaining back in the day where he was scratching his head going, ah, I didn't quite get that right. He actually created man precisely as he desired, and he didn't just claim it to be good, he claimed it to be very good. And so as a result, I think it would be wise for us to recognize the God that said that is. And as a result, his opinion then would be his opinion now, which would be his opinion forever. God declared something very good. I'm going to go with that. God created woman out of man. 
defining two distinct expressions of his holy image, male and female. And as a result of this astounding work, still in green, gender must be understood as God's idea. Gender is clearly God's creation. And gender is an obvious extension of God's will. It is what he desires. It is what he designed. It's what he intends. And remember, the one we're talking about is, which means he doesn't alter. God does not evolve over time. We have a modern rendition of Christianity that wants to make it seem like God is shape-shifting with every generation to get public approval ratings up. But God is a rock. And if you study a rock, you're going to find out that generation after generation after generation, it remains the same. That's interesting. That, the culture around it changes, but that rock is the same, same shape. How, how does that work? It's God. It's who he is. So even though we change as humans, God doesn't. And so when we want to get back to the proper yoke, the yoke that actually enables us to fulfill our purpose, we have to get rid of yokes that are hindering us from our purpose. I'll get, I'll get back to that in the future, just in case you're thinking I'm done with that topic. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, even though that's a politically incorrect scripture these days, it's scripture. And it is something that gives us a sense of reality in the midst of nonsense. There is a world that is full of fog because they are resisting the clear word of scripture. And when you follow fact with your faith, you gain balance and are able to pull off a life that actually sees clearly and actually works. But when you reject the fact and you turn allow feeling to govern you, then you lose balance in your life and it creates a chaos. And anyone who is walking in following their feeling, they may not like what I am saying right now, however, their life is in a state of chaos. And so as a result, my hand reaching out would be to say, hey, take hold of the truth. God wants to set us free so that we can function as we were designed. Genesis 5, 2, he created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. Number five, the principle of exception. Now, this is a blue color. Uh, so where, where are we? Roy G. B. Uh, and so we're at the, we're starting to work on Biv, guys. Aren't you excited? And so this is our blue and God never changes, which you've already established, right? He is. And there are no exceptions to this. In other words, he doesn't alter in who he is. There's no exception to the fact that he changes. So then I'm going to say 5A. This is still blue. But what about, there's multiple situations in the Bible where you could say, it seems like God is contradicting himself. And I would say, no, 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 no. God doesn't contradict himself. His nature is set. Who he is, he is. And so then we could go to Jonah 3.10. Then God saw their works. Remember, this is Nineveh. He has declared he's going to judge them. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented, or another translation says repented, from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Whoa, we have a God who seems to be all over the place here. He says he's going to judge, and then he changes? I'm calling this the principle of the exception. And yet there's no exception in God's nature and his characters. You could say, well, what's he doing here then? He says he's going to do something, then he doesn't do it? No, actually who he is is being proven all the more true in this story. And even Jonah knows it. Jonah is really upset. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh and speak anything that would possibly help them. He would rather have judgment on this people. However, God has called Jonah to go to the people of Nineveh, who are Assyrians, and share with them the truth. Why would Jonah not want to? Because this group of people has created terror for the Israelites. I mean, killed Israelites, destroyed Israelites. And he knows that they deserve judgment. So why wouldn't Jonah want to obey God and declare that they're going to be judged? Uh, because Jonah knows God. And he knows that God is a God of mercy. And if he shares with them and they repent, then God will show mercy. That's exactly what is said in this story. God's nature doesn't change in this story. God is a God of mercy, and his mercy always is higher than his judgment. 
So if there is repentance, if there is humility, there is always mercy given. Always. That is a guarantee. So even though it may look like an exception, or it may look like God is going outside of the framework of his nature, he is the same. He is. He always was this way, and he always will be this way. Whenever someone humbles themselves, when they repent, God will always show mercy first. His desire is not to bring judgment. His desire is to bring salvation. That is who he is. So God's order of operations, and many of you have heard me say this because I, I come to it all the time, and just like the algebraic order of operations, uh, which is PEMDAS, we have all sorts of uh, fun memory techniques in this one, don't we? Uh, so parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, and addition, subtraction. You could do any one of those skills correctly, but if you do them out of order, you get the problem wrong. It's really frustrating if you're a math student. It's like, but I got my, my addition perfect. You did. I got my subtraction. Look at my subtraction. Perfect. Yeah, but you started with subtraction. So many Christians start with subtraction. And that's what Jonah wants to start with. He's like, I want to start with subtraction of the Assyrians. And God says, no, 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 no. We start way over here. Uh, we need to start with parentheses, which in God's economy is mercy. God specializes in giving mercy. When Jesus comes to this earth and he's teaching, what is he teaching? He's teaching about like lost sons and lost coins and lost sheep. He is showing his nature that even though in Israel they would say that guy deserves to be cut off, Jesus says, I desire to save him. And this is part of who he is, that though it may look on the outside to someone who wants to throw criticism at God, that he sounds like he's changing his mind. When in actuality, even though the woman caught in adultery is given a reprieve, how could a God who is holy and just give a reprieve to that woman? And yet God is not changing his nature in so doing. It is his design to give mercy and to give that grace whenever it is possible. So with God, it is guaranteed that mercy is his first option. Always. 5C, we're still in the blue color. But what about, okay, so remember, this is called the principle of the exception, because this is the classic thing that happens. You give a truth, and then everyone's like, but what about, but what about, but what about, but what about, that didn't say, sound very clear, right? But you understand. So Acts 5, 27 through 29, and when they had brought them, speaking of the apostles, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. They have a good point here. Because we're talking about a very, very important character known as the high priest. And the high priest has been given authority in Israel to minister the law and to make judgment in that territory. And as a result, these Jews would have been submitted to that priesthood, especially the high priest. And you can imagine, you know, he says, didn't I give you a strict command? It came from the high priest. He's saying that right now. And if all, any of us in here are going to have to acknowledge, that should be obeyed. Remember, I'm calling this the principle of the exception. You see, well, then how could these guys disobey it? And Peter answers that. says, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That does not mean that you don't obey men. It means that if the issue is between God and men, and you are being forced to contradict God in any assignment that you are given by any authority, you go with God. And though that may look like a contradiction where God has called you to obey in this situation, that is actually the fulfillment of you heeding the fact. In every situation, you follow the fact, even if your earthly authority goes rogue and goes away from that fact, you are still accountable, first and foremost, to that fact. 5D, so we're still in the blue category for those that are getting this via podcast. Uh, as far as it depends on you. See, this is a scripture right here in Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And I would say, in a general sense, your desire in when God yokes you in any situation, now I haven't given you any samples of this, but I could hint and I could say, for instance, God has yoked you with a national government, okay? And you are under a governing system. Somehow, some way, you're under something, right? And you didn't choose it. In a strange way, you could say God yoked you. 
and you're like yoked with this government? Well, imagine how the early Christians felt with, being, with Nero's government. It's like they're yoked, but then they're told to submit. And well, as, as far as it is, as far as it depends on us, we are to live peaceably in that situation. There are also illustrations of those that were even slaves that are called to, in a sense, live peaceably to, as far as it depends on them in that role of being a slave. It's not to just revolt, but to actually honor those that are above you, even if they be ungodly, right? So when we talk about the principle of the exception, the issue comes in when as a slave or as a citizen, I am asked to do something that would violate the clear word of God. And I cannot do that, and I would rather die than do that, and that's called an issue of conscience. And when the issue of conscience comes into play, we have to go with God as opposed to men, even if it's the high priest telling us to do it. Number 5E, so this is still in the blue territory, the principle of the exception. There is a prescribed God ideal yoke, and there is a proper action to take when it is absent due to man's sin. So because of man's sin, certain God-designed yokes sometimes become a bit confusing for us. For instance, I'm going to give you another hint of a God-designed yoke. Parents. When you have been given parents, you didn't choose those parents, but you have a yoke to those parents, right? And it's actually a God design. It's what he intended. However, when sin comes in, sometimes those parents divorce. Sometimes you're missing a parent. Sometimes you don't have any parents. Sometimes your parents go rogue and they go against God. And as a result, it creates tensions within those of us that could be called children to know how to obey our parents and honor our parents in light of that conflagration, that challenge that is being brought to us. However, principle, our desire is to submit just as a slave to the slave owner, even if they be unjust and ungodly, to live peaceably in, our, in that situation as far as it depends on us. And the same is true with government, and the same is true in a family. However, when there is a request to go against the clear word of God, that becomes a separate matter, and that is part of the tensions that we face in a world that is going away from God. All right, guys, now here's where it starts to get fun. On the screen right now, for those of you that are getting this via podcast, you can't fully appreciate this, but now I'm beginning to combine colors. So now we have one, which is the word, you know, what is a word, and it's a, it's a carrying device of the invisible, and we have four, which is gender. And so it looks a little like Christmas, because we have red and green up there. And the battleground of gender doesn't really feel like a Christmas topic, uh, but uh, this morning it sort of is. So I'm going to call gender a chief place of revelation that has become a chief place of perversion. I understand why the devil is after this. Let me just say it that way. Because gender is actually, which for those of you that are like looking at the word gender and I haven't really defined it, I'm a man. There's a few people in here that are women. And as a result, that's part of my, that's my gender. I am a man. And I am not a woman. And so as a result, that's a definition of my sexuality, my make by God. And in so understanding, there is a way that a man has been uniquely called to live his life. And when I do that, I actually reveal the invisible realm clearly to this world. I have an assignment as a man. Even in ancient Israel, you see this pattern of twos. And you see that women are given an assignment, you see that men are given an assignment, but then even at the national level of Israel, you have like king and priest, and you see one is supposed to be over the temple and to keep the home of God, and the other one is ruling the entire territory. You see these roles that are playing, and if a king tries to function as the priest, it doesn't work, and if the priest tries to function as the king, it doesn't work. You see in Christ the fulfillment of all of that. We are the body of Christ to reveal in and through, ironically, our gender, who God is in this realm. He, his revelation is invisible. No one can see Christ seated at the right hand of God. No one can see his authority. No one can truly understand him except through his revelation. And he has chosen his word as a revelation, but he's also chosen the, the, the body of Christ to reveal the manifold wisdom of God unto the heavenly realms. 
We are the chosen vehicle of doing it, and we do it, ironically, in and through gender. That is part of the revelation. So we still have our uh, red-green uh, color scheme up there, and it still says the battleground of gender. Gender is God's chosen means of revealing himself on this earth. Now, most of us have never thought about it that way. However, if I said humanity is God's chosen means of revealing himself on this earth, that would make sense, right? However, there's two forms. There's two ways that that divine image is being revealed right now, male and female. And so as a result, when I take it one step further, and I say gender is his chosen means through which he reveals who he is. That is still an accurate statement. And I'm going to build on it here. It is in and through the male expression, the manly expression of God's nature, and the female expression of God's nature, as well as through the covenant marriage of the male and female together that God is most clearly seen in this earth. And I would say that we as believers have taken this lightly. When I remember when uh, the Supreme Court made their judgment and, and basically redefined marriage, and the church was you know, beside itself with horror. And yet, I remember having a very clear thought, well, this is the result when the church itself doesn't take marriage seriously. I mean, why, why should the world tremble before the living God when we, the revelatory devices of him, do not take marriage seriously? Now, I don't know if this is true, okay? This could be one of those weird statistics that just gets dished out to sort of mock the church. I don't know. But I remember a few years back that it was Christians that had a higher divorce rate than non-Christians. Now, again, like I said, that could be a fudged uh, piece of statistic, but the fact that we have even won bothers me. <laughs> In other words, what is going on here? We're the ones that God has entrusted with these roles to play, to reveal the unseen realm, but we don't take it seriously. How can we expect a world out there to take it seriously if we don't? You see, if we live marriage as it ought to be, then they would say, I want what you have. You don't want what we have. We don't have anything to boast about. Or do we? Let's get our game on as the church and show this world what a man, what a woman, what a godly marriage is supposed to be and let them behold his glory. Matthew 19, three through six. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him. So the Pharisees came to Jesus, testing Jesus and saying to Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So when they are no longer two, but one flesh, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So this one statement is repeated at many marriages uh, these days. And I understand why, even though I'd say most marriages don't understand why. I don't think most people understand the significance of that statement. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So I'm you know, zooming in on that one phrase, Matthew 19, 6. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. However, if you're here in the building, you're seeing something different on the screen. Instead of joined together, the word is actually yoked. What God has yoked, what God has fixed with one of his yokes, you know, one of those God yokes, when he has yoked something, let no man ever break that apart. This is not something that you come in and meddle with. When God has knit two things together, then it is an inviolable structure. So here's our big word, and we're going to start combining some things. So we have number one, two, three, and four. Uh, so we have the word, we have fact, faith, and experience, we have the brilliance of yoking, and we have uh, the uh, brilliance of gender. I, what, I forgot what our gender statement was, but it had something to do with gender. It's green. And this is sudzugnomi. You can go home and maybe even call your parents if you're a student here and, and just sort of drop it in the, con you know, it's like, yeah, any anyone that God has sug Sudzugnomid, uh, let no man separate, you know, and they'd be like, what was that? It's like, I, you know, I, oh yeah, I probably should speak in English. I'm so used to the Koine Greek now. <laughs> it means to fasten to, to one yoke, yoke together, to join together, to unite. That God does this. 
And this term isn't just used in the context of marriage. This is a term, an understood term in an agrarian culture. But God is saying that he does this. He yokes things together. What God has, and this is my amplified version of it, what God has fastened, joined, united, and yoked together, let no man attempt to rip apart, disintegrate the bond, or break the yoke. So this is a sacred territory. This is not something to be trifled with. This is God territory. This is not like our own opinion being brought to the table. This is God's design. This is God's will. And when God has put something together, whoa, we show respect for it. So number six, now we're at uh, Indigo, is that right? So we're Roy G. B. and we're making our way. We haven't gotten to B uh, yet. We're, we're almost to the violet, but we're at Indigo, which I had to look up what color Indigo actually was. I know it's like a purple blue, but it's like, I don't know what, in, how, could I, how could I describe Indigo? When I see someone's shirt, I go, oh, that's Indigo. I, I don't even do that, but it's sort of like a dark bluish purple, I guess, right? And so that's where we're at here with a dark bluish purple known as Indigo. God hates divorce. So let's read the scripture in Malachi 2.16 that says that. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Now, see if you can expand your understanding of the divorce. Now, since I'm talking about yoking, what it is is it's dissolving that yoke. You see, this yoke that God has put together, let no man separate. This is not something you take lightly. This is something that God has ordained. This is something very, very important. And we do not take it lightly. And so the Lord God of Israel says that he hates this breaking of a yoke. He hates this separation that he didn't intend. Now, this is also the color indigo, and it's 6A, the two degrees of divorce. So historically, there's actually two different kinds of divorce. This is really weird, you know, because I think most of us in here, we think of divorce. There's only one kind of divorce. That's the only kind of divorce we have. But we have, and this is some good Latin for you, divorce omensa et thoro, which means it's a divorce from bed and board, which for some reason there's going to be a separation with hope of reconciliation. I don't even think most of us have ever heard of that. That's like a weird thought. And then we have what we're more commonly understanding, and that is divorce aspero atem uh, reconciliation. <laughs> that's how you actually say it. I don't know if you followed it closely, but that's, that's good Latin right there. And it means divorce from, a, from hope of reconciliation. It's a complete separation. There is now no hope. This is called legal divorcement, final disillusion of the relationship with, without hope of reconciliation. So we're going to start building again. We have two, three, four, five, and six, but what about, and we probably should have a one on there. I'm not sure why I don't have my one on there, but uh, so add a little red in your mind. But what about unfaithfulness? So when God says he hates divorce, is there an exception to this? So when we get to the principle of the exception, just like we see with Peter and the apostles, is there an exception to this? And of course, many of us you know, that have gone through the Bible, for whatever reason, issues on marriage when you're young and divorce always stand out to you. It's like you see them more clearly than most other things. And most of you know that there could be an issue with infidelity or unfaithfulness or sexual immorality, depends on your translation, where it's just like, that seems to be like a open possibility. So, but what about unfaithfulness? Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. This is Jesus speaking. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So we have this. It says it, and that is clear in Scripture. But we're going to begin to, there's my one. Somehow it was not on the other one, but it made it onto this one. We're going to combine all six of these. And when you begin to see that God has given us fact, he's also said, follow the fact instead of your feelings. And then he's going to talk about a yoke and the significance of a yoke. And then he's going to talk about gender. So in this situation, it's what a just man should do. What should a man do if he was just? And then we have five, the principle of the exception, which we just read, right, as far as if it's for unfaithfulness. And then we have six, God hates divorce. But if there's an exception, even though God hates it, he also hates that behavior. 
And so sometimes you have to mediate between these things and make the decision that is honorable to God. What would a just man do? So Matthew 1.19 says, Then Joseph, her husband, this is Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, being a just man, he just found out that Mary's pregnant. Well, for those of you that understand pregnancy and things like that, you know that <clears throat> if someone's pregnant and it wasn't you that made them pregnant, we got a problem here, right? And that's called unfaithfulness. Even though we know in this room Mary wasn't unfaithful, Joseph only has one thing, one lens to go through. I mean, how in the world is he supposed to reason through this? Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. So how's this just man going to work? And not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. That's the New King James. And then let's look at the NIV. It says he had a mi in mind to divorce her quietly. And then the ESV and RSV both say resolved to divorce her quietly. So we see God not making a commentary on it. We just see that Joseph, in seeing the situation, still wanting to honor Mary but, and not publicly disgrace her, but he's going to need to divorce her for this. This is, a, this is a major transgression. This is not a small thing. So what would a just man do? He would divorce her, but do it quietly and respectfully, right? So I'm saying the same thing, but listen to this. But don't miss the but. In this statement, which I didn't read you the full statement, there's going to be a statement that says, but. And that but in this story is actually very, very important for our soul. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to put her away, pub, put her, sorry, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But. You see, God is going to intervene and explain something to Joseph. God is going to give Joseph his heart in this situation. You could say the same thing with multiple stories in the Old Testament and in the New, where that which is just to do and right to do could be carried out. Now, I've already explained to you that God is not contradicting himself when he offers mercy. If there is any avenue through which he can offer mercy, that is his design. And what you're going to see in this situation is God is going to preserve the integrity of Mary's reputation. Now, all she's trying to do is walk out obedience, right? I mean, this is a pretty tough situation for her, too. How do you think she felt having her husband find out that she was pregnant? That's not going to translate very well. However, God is going to care for Mary in a beautiful way, and I love that. However, there are other situations where a just man could, in fact, do exactly what jo Joseph is going to do. And yet, oftentimes, there can also be a but. And in each of our souls, I want to allow that B-U-T to land there, to actually cause us to pause and to say, okay, God, this would be maybe totally right, but I want to behave like you would in this situation. It is just and right to divorce for unfaithfulness. Therefore, it would be just and right for God to cut us off forever. Let that sink into your soul just for a second. But. You see, that but is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we could say, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, what you see is the sacredness of a yoke, that what God intended. You see, he did not divorce us in the Garden of Eden the way many of us would think. He divorced us in that first method which was from bed and board, in hopes of a reconciliation. Actually, we could say with a plan of a reconciliation. However, if we do not embrace that reconciliation now, there is a true divorcement that will come in the final judgment that we're, in which there is no reconciliation. I'm going to read this again because it has enough weight in it to warrant us waking up and seeing it. It's just and right to divorce for unfaithfulness, therefore it would be just and right for God to cut us off forever. But, but Jesus, but grace, but mercy. You see, in each situation here, I want us to see the weight of God's design and that he is willing to go to great lengths to preserve the integrity of his yoking in our life. Number seven, God's ways are perfect. We have just officially finished Roy G. Biv. Now we have some violet on the screen. Nice color. 
Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. I don't know if that brings up a memory to Leslie. However, our first book was called His Perfect Faithfulness. It was based on that scripture because we witnessed when we followed God, he took care of us. He was faithful. His ways are right. When he fixes a yoke and we show respect to it, it's extraordinary what takes place. Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just, a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. When we heed his revelation, when we trust our God, he's good, his ways are right, his ways are perfect, his ways are just, and his ways, ways are ruled by mercy. His mercy endures forever. So we have all seven colors up on the screen, and this is a summation of it right here. Therefore, what God has yoked together, let no man separate. So what has he yoked together? So let's apply this. The yoking is applied to parents and children. You see, there's a sacred yoking that is there. I mean, you had no choice when you were in your mother's womb, and then some of you were adopted. You didn't really have a lot of say in some of these things. You just found that God supernaturally has orchestrated your life. You could mumble and groan and grumble and complain about that all day long. We do that about most things that God has yoked us with. He also yoked us with our body. You ever thought about that? It's like this crazy thing. It doesn't work. That's the way I felt yesterday at that game night. It's like it wasn't working the way I wanted it to work. And it doesn't look the way I want it. My ears aren't quite right. My nose is not the way I would want it. My hair is stringy, whatever it is, okay? I wasn't talking to any of you specifically, right? And we can have a grumble and a complaint, but if we learn to accept the yoke that God has given us and thrive in that, God will reveal himself to this world. However, when we grumble in it, you may have it challenging. You may have it difficult, but if you respond but with faith to what God has entrusted you. And you grow up in that with grace and say, God, I need grace for this yoke that you have given me. I trust that you have, have given it to me and I want to thrive in it. Instead of breaking it apart because it doesn't fit what you desire, but instead saying, God, you gave me that but so that you didn't cut me off. And I don't want to cut off people in my life either. I want to foster that which you have given me. So children, obey your parents. And then we also have, Moses said, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. In other words, that's how serious this yoke is. This is a big deal. This isn't a small thing in the kingdom of heaven. How about this one? <clears throat> the yoking is applied to ahem, gender. Isn't it an interesting thought to think that you had no choice of the gender you are? And many people would say, well, I do have a choice. And that's the problem right there. Actually, you don't have a choice. You are who you are, made in the image of God, perfect, just as he desired you to be. And as a result, when you accept that yoking, instead of trying to break it, instead of trying to alter it, when you accept that, it actually causes you to thrive. And some people would say, God made a mistake in making me the way he did. He did not make a mistake. That did not come from God, that statement. That came from the devil. The devil wants you to constantly be at odds with the way that you're designed. And he will never sponsor contentment. He will never sponsor joy in your circumstances. But God will. If you will turn to God and say, God, thank you for the yoke that you've given me here. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So there is a design for everything he yokes. So let's look at just a few of them. Parenting and childhood development. So you could look at it as a parent that you got yoked with these kids. <laughs> it could sound terrible, right? And you could look at it as a child that you got yoked with these parents. It's like, whoa, what is the deal here? And yet when you embrace that yoke, you can thrive. Manhood. I'm yoked to manhood. I either accept it and thrive in it, or I complain about it and grumble and try and change things. And if I accept it, I can thrive. Femininity. Same truth. Governing authorities. Um, that's a tense one in the current condition of America because we feel like, hey, this is a government for the people, by the people. And some of you are still not exactly sure if the current administration should be there, right? And yet, it is there. And you have to trust that it is a God yoke, that God has given you these circumstances, this time period in which to live, thrive in it. Don't 
argue and complain and grumble. We're wasting our time. We have a lost and dying world, and I don't want us to spend it complaining over here. I want us to thrive rejoicing, saying, God, you do it. Out of this circumstance, I want to shine forth your glory. You can only imagine early Christians were not overly happy about Nero's plans to make them human torches for his feasts. And you can understand why they might want to have a little civil disobedience on the matter or over the matter. However, that's not the reason for civil disobedience. However, if Nero asks them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, now there is a good reason for civil disobedience. In other words, civil disobedience has always been a part of Christian history. But there are certain things that many of us presume should be our point of disobedience that isn't. When in actuality, we're supposed to embrace the yoke that we have, and we're supposed to live peaceably with all men as far as it depends on us. And then finally, marriage. Now, marriage is something that God has designed. And when God authors it, it is a very, very precious thing. And it is not meant to be broken. It is meant to be secured. So the five divine yoking zones and the four principles that bind them all together, they are areas of God's providential joining, They're God's chief means of revelation. Every single thing I just said is the way that we show Jesus more clearly than any other way. And it just happens to be where we are yoked by God. They are the most damaging areas to humanity when broken from God. When these things get broken from God, you could take any one of those. When parents go rogue, when children go rogue, when masculinity goes weird, when femininity goes off, when governing authorities uh, become despots, and when marriages fall to pieces... What happens? The world falls to pieces, right there. These yoke zones are the point of contention. This is why the devil is after them. The brilliance of the five zones, when you get these right, everything works. When you get these wrong, everything falls to pieces. So what does it say of children for a parent? They're like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior. And if you have kids, at first you're thinking, I think that's a little overstatement. You know, I don't really feel like there are arrows in my hand. There's strength is another translation of that. Strength in the hand, uh, they're draining me of all my money and all my time. And yet, when a parent embraces that task and that yoking that God has given them, do you know that it actually increases strength within the parent? A parent will grow strong when they embrace that yoking that God has supplied them. Same with the children. When the children embrace even the more challenging parent, Even the parent that doesn't seem to get it, that seems to be lost in a previous decade, whatever it is, when you embrace that as a child instead of argue against it and you live peaceably within that home as far as it depends on you, then life begins to spring forth. And if you're a boy, you grow into a man. You see, if you spurn this beginning stage, it stunts your development to truly reveal the kingdom of heaven through your gender. Or if you're a woman, you reveal it through your femininity. And when you are growing up to be a man or a woman of God, as God intended, then you will change the earth. In and through governing authorities, the way you handle your government and your society and your culture will be revealed in and through you. We can actually see the living, walking, breathing word of God in and through us, the church. And then marriage, the taste of heaven on earth. When we embrace these different yokes, then suddenly the grand revelation in and through marriage is shown. You want to have a great marriage? Well, don't skip over those first four on the list. In other words, the way that we're handling these other yokes is tempering and training our soul to thrive in whatever zone we enter into. Respect the God yoke in order to be excellent with all future yokes. You know, if you're thrown into prison, that could be a yoke. I don't know if they're going to stick a yoke, but they could. They could stick a little chain around your neck and tie you to the floor, right? A yoke. And if you embrace the God yoke, guess what? You're going to be great with that yoke. I don't care if it comes from the enemy. You're not choosing it, right? You choose to engage in your yoke. Everything God has given you, and you thrive in that, you will thrive in any situation, no matter if it's from God or from the enemy. It doesn't make any difference. You know how to carry a yoke well. When you pull correctly with God's yoking, you are prepared to succeed in all subsequent yokings. Come to me, says Jesus, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's Christianity right there. Yoke with me, says God. 
Enter into my yoke and you'll find that we can fulfill this task together. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But yoked to me, you can fulfill the Great Commission. And finally, 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 18. Oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak to you as children. You also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now you're going to see this term be used with all sorts of things. Do not be yoked with something that is unlike what God is taking you. God is taking you this way, not this way. And so if you're going to be yoked, you must be yoked the way God intended you to be yoked. Do not be yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of, God, temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Leave all other yokes. Leave all other yoke fellows. It's like if I just have this, I could carry out my task so much better. I tell you what, there's a huge bait in this world to ally with worldly systems, worldly ways of doing things so that you can fulfill your task. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So, we just went through a lot, okay? That rainbow strategy was a doozy uh, of a strategy, whether or not it worked. Remember that one guy on the back of his oat milk uh, can or canister or carton? He said, I love my products. I don't know that I like the color in this one, but I love the message. I love the truth. And I hope it works for you to begin to gel and to see the significance of the hour in which we live that what is being threatened is a yoke that God has created, that he has designed us to thrive in. And even if this world continues to go in that direction, the key for us is to not break that yoke and to not treat that yoke lightly in our own life, nor to treat it lightly in other people's lives, lightly in other people's lives. This is critical for us to know the importance and the weight and the severity of these matters. Father, I ask that you would instruct us, that you would teach us, and that you would bind us, that you would yoke us with yourself so that we could have rest for our souls, so that we could fulfill this commission. Lord, we feel the burden. We feel the task in front of us, but we feel like it's too big for us. And that's why you say, come to me, all you who are laboring or heavy laden, and you will give us rest. Lord, we want to come to you and receive that yoke that you have assigned us. We want to pick up that cross and follow. And Lord, that is the great secret of actually being able to fulfill the great task. We love you and trust you. It's in the precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to transition.